do what God wants me to do and preach a third instead. What God has given me to speak to you about is just because of the move of the Holy Ghost right now. Praise God. Mark 4 and 39. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased. There was a great calm. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for what you're doing today. Thank you, Lord, for the of your spirit that is happening in this place. And I am here just to facilitate that. We pray that the word would go forth as you would have it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I just want to talk to you today on the subject, Master of the Chaos. Master of the Chaos. The work, the, the most harsh way that you can speak to another person is to rebuke them. It is intended in the scripture in evil ways and in good ways. It is spoken of in the scripture, excuse me, in evil ways and in good ways. There are times when people rebuke others and they had no right to do that. Then there are times when people rebuke others and they were misunderstanding. We know that Peter rebuked Jesus and then Jesus rebuked Peter and calling him Satan. And we know that there are times when people were rebuked in the Old and New Testament by people who desire to destroy them and hurt them. We know that in the New Testament, we are taught that uh, Jesus rebuked demons, which is to speak down to them and to correct them with authority, and that Paul sometimes rebuked people. We know Peter did as well. Uh, we know that Peter and Paul had sharp words and rebuked each other and had to come to a meeting of the minds in correction we know that Paul told Timothy and Titus to train the church and lead them and at times to rebuke them. Here, Jesus was not speaking to a person. He was speaking to the elements of nature. And I've come today to tell you that no matter what it looks like around you, no matter what is flying in the air around you, no matter what kind of situation you're in that feels like a hurricane, and a, or a tornado, and, and seeing a truck fly around you in a circle is a really good way to tell that you're in a tornado, by the way. I know that there are people who have been picked up by tornadoes and set down, and uh, most of the time that does not happen, but there is a measure of a feeling within us that that is chaos. But I've come today to tell you that the wind and the waves are not what we think they are. We feel like there is chaos in our lives, but the master of the chaos understands that everything that exists in this world, for those people that are living for God, is a part of his order. The enemy is able to create chaos in the lives of those people who have not submitted themselves to him. But the enemy is only able to mimic chaos in the lives of those people who are su submitted to him. Right. The enemy is only able to do that because the Bible reveals to us that even the very whirlwinds of the earth, the snows, the rain, are all ordered by God. Because let me ask you a question. What exactly is the wind and what exactly are the waves? And if you look at it from a geological standpoint, if you look at it from a meteorological standpoint, you can see that we don't fully have an answer for the interaction between the wind and the waves and why waves do what they do and why wind does what it does. We have some understanding of the fact that the majority of the major winds in this world and the jet streams of this world and what we call the trade winds, which come from warm and cold climates, are created by the waves themselves. The waves create the wind. We know that mountains create wind because mountains are bottlenecks and sometimes they create winds as the wind tries to make it over and does not make it over. It is pushed back by the mountain, something big enough. Imagine that, a mountain, something big enough to affect the atmosphere. We know that there are other things in this world that affect the winds that are from outside of our atmosphere. But we understand that ultimately God has placed his creation upon this earth and the wind and waves are controlled by him. We understand that behind those winds that were created 
by the waves of the ocean is the power of gravity and that is forced upon the waters of this world of which the entire world was created in totality before God spoke any land into existence there was only the waves and that moon that circumnavigates our world and in, in its orbit has been placed by God regardless of any, what anyone would tell you God created that moon and he did it so to rule the night of the earth and when he did it it became in control of those waves and it creates the tide as amazing as it sounds not just upon the oceans but upon every lake there is a somewhat of a little bit of a tide and there's a tide on Lake Superior and the power of that moon is controlling a good portion of the winds of this world and wind is a very seemingly chaotic uh, uh, event that happens in our lives when it blows upon us but I've come to tell you that it's all just part of God's order it's all just part of God's order because without the moon and without the gravitational tug of that moon that's just over 280,000 miles away from us right now, it is affecting our very lives. You say, we don't live on the ocean. I'm telling you, it's affecting our lives even right now. And it's part of God's order. And the storm was there upon them. Jesus understood the order because Jesus was who? God manifest in flesh. Not Jehovah Jr. He was God manifest in flesh. He was housed in a completely human vessel. And Jesus Christ had his own mind, his own thoughts, his own spirit, and his own body. He was not a fake. He was not a puppet. But at the same time, he was God in the same moment, having a dual nature. So understanding the power of creation he knew that who he was in himself, he had the ability to put that storm in its place with the sharpest word one can ever give to another person. And he treated the wind and the waves as if they were a child. Now, when I was growing up, we were moving away from uh, what, what people insultingly call parenting. They call it authoritarian parenting. We were moving away from that in popular culture, whereas uh, Focus on the Family and Dr. Dobson were trying to hold on to biblical parenting. But we were told, don't correct your child and only give positive reinforcement and all of these things. Now we're moving back. If, if anybody's ever heard of the super nanny, we're moving back to authoritarian parenting where you, you can use sharp words at times as long as they're not degrading words to correct your child. And if you look at this scripture in more modern texts, it is very much like a parent correcting a child with sharp words. Stop. You're going to burn your hand. Get away from that stove. Don't throw that fire extinguisher at your brother. <laughs> Get away from my car keys right now. Anybody ever have a kid that drove when they were a toddler? I knew someone that, that would, when he was three years old, he drove the van and, and it was our uh, school principal. <laughs> This little boy was three years old and he drove the, the homeschool special. If you don't know what a homeschool special is, anytime you see a 15 passenger van that's four wheel drive, you know that that's the homeschool special. He drove the homeschool special and he, he drove it into the house. You, you, if you saw the kid going for uh, the gear shift, you would shout or else you don't care about that child. Correction. And so the Lord spoke sharply to the wind and the waves. Not because they were out of order. They were doing what they were supposed to do. And if you know anything, if you've ever been, I've only been three times out on Mille Lacs, but I know people that have been on Mille Lacs more than me, and they will tell you that it creates its own storms. And we've been experiencing the goodness of Lake Superior this week. We had a snow hurricane. And if you didn't notice it, it wasn't just a snowstorm stalling out over Superior. It was spinning in a circle. And you could see it in all of its glory yesterday because we were in the eye of it. You could see it in Wisconsin. You could see it to the north. It was breaking up to the west. It was breaking up to the south. And then you get back around to the eastern view. You could see, and you could see the, just like anybody ever been able to see rain from a distance when it's coming down, you know, it looks gray. Snow is not gray at an angle. Snow is gray that's coming down in swirls. And you can see it was coming down. We were in the midst of that. And the, the order of nature was that this is what's going to happen. 
Everything that we feel that is chaotic in our lives, if we're living for the Lord, is both part of God's order and completely subject to our walking in the Spirit in our own voice. Everything can be controlled. The chaos can be controlled by our own voice through the power of the Holy Ghost, through the power of the name of Jesus, by the authority of the blood of Jesus. It's already part of God's order because it cannot hurt you unless it's going to happen for your good and your benefit. I can't promise you what it's going to do to other people, and I'm so sorry to say that, but I am saying for you as you stay under the blood Jesus and walk in the name and the spirit of Jesus. The order that exists is for your benefit. And at any time that you feel that it is going to harm you, you only need to speak the name of Jesus and, and take authority. Praise God. Jesus didn't have to do that. He's the only one that ever lived that didn't have to do that. He didn't have to say in the name of Jesus, Brother James. He did not say, peace be still, still in the name of Jesus. Right. He didn't have to. Right. He didn't have to rebuke the, de the demon, the, the man that had 2,000 demons in him. They revealed how many there were legion. As I understand, was 2,000 soldiers. They revealed we are many. He didn't have to say in the name of Jesus, come out of it. They came to him and said, we know who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But we do have to use the name of Jesus. Right. Yes. And if we use it erroneously, we're going to be like the sons of Siva who didn't know Jesus. And therefore, because they didn't know Jesus, they were sons of the vagabond Jews. They were not known of the spirits. Yeah. But I am telling you unequivocally that if you are walking in the spirit of God to the best of your ability, if you're perfect. No, 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 no. Didn't say that. Amen. If you've never known a fault in your life. Did I say that? Does the word of God say that? Does the word of God say that we can walk in the spirit because we have no weaknesses? Does it say that? I want to hear it a little bit louder from you. Does the Bible say that? No, it does not. The Bible says it is because of our infirmities, because of our weaknesses, that he is able to flow through us and speak through us and control what we think is chaos, what the devil thinks is what we're doing now. I want to hear it now. I'm sitting in some chaos. And the Lord says, do you think that's chaos? I created the earth to give forth storms and winds and tornadoes and waves and great depths and icy waters. I created the Leviathan, the Bible says, to play in the seas. The modern world hasn't even seen that yet. But when the last days come, they're going to they're going to see the things in the oceans that no man has ever seen since the ancient times, because God created things that people believe to be chaos. And the devil believes his own mind comp. He believes his own my story. He believes his own story. Therefore he foolishly and erroneously believes that he controls the chaos. And it works for some people. But I'm telling you that I know the master of the chaos. And he speaks to those winds and waves and says, I told you. I, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, cease your raging and be still. Stop and be still. Praise God. Praise God. That is the way Jesus spoke to them. Somebody needs to get loud with your problems. Somebody needs to speak because Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do. You don't have to shout at your problems all the time. But sometimes you need to. Sometimes you need to cry out in prayer. Sometimes those problems are not going to respond to anything but the depths of the emotional and spiritual fire within your being because you are speaking to them. And again, I say unto you, I wish I could give you a good word about other people, but I can only tell you about yourself. Because Psalm 119 says, My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. Your soul is the only one that you can carry to heaven. Amen. Now, of course we pray for other people. Of course there's power in intercession. But I'm telling you that the chaos that surrounds you is not a surprise to God. Right. It is not chaos in His view. Right. It is not chaos in His view. It is order. And people that don't like to believe in God use the seeming chaos and disarray 
of the world to explain if there was a good God, these things wouldn't happen. What they miss out on in their ridiculous philosophical argument is the question, what then do you believe in? Because if they don't believe in God and they blame him for the frustrations they have with the natural world because it's always a natural disaster that they like to blame on God. If it's not that, it's war, which God didn't start. So the answer to the problem of war and why would God allow war to happen is that God didn't start the war. But we can say, I understand what you're saying. If you're blaming nature, if you're mad about the hurricane, I understand what you're saying. Okay, I get that. You can say that to someone that doesn't believe in God. But then you have to ask them the question, what then do you believe in? They're always going to say, when they, when they are focusing on honesty within themselves, they're going to say, I believe in humanity. That's great. You just fell into my trap. Because if you believe in humanity, tell me one good thing that humanity has done for itself. Because humanity has done nothing but destroy. Humanity knows nothing but force. Humanity knows nothing but violence. And the, the, the power of a hurricane and an earthquake and a volcano together pale in comparison to what mankind has done to itself and to each other throughout history. Right. Nothing but great evil. God controls the nature of this world and He controls what you're going through right now. And He is waiting for you to speak out and to commit to Him your situation. Because He will hold you and He will give you peace. Jesus was comfortable in the storm because he was on a pillow. We know that he was comfortable in the storm. He was not just on a pillow, he was asleep. He was not helping them. He didn't feel that he had to help them. And that's why they came to him and rebuked him and said, do you not care that we are all about to die? Have you ever felt like you were about to die? Maybe some of you have had a heart attack. Maybe some of you have gone down to death's door when you brought a child into this world. Maybe some of you had a situation when you were having a baby and you felt like you were going to die. Maybe you've had cancer. Maybe you've been in a terrifying car accident. These are the types of things that make us think about eternity. These are the types of things that make us call out to Jesus. And the disciples felt like they were going to die. But Jesus did not feel like he was going to die. This right there, folks, is an example of the way we should be comparing ourselves to Jesus. We should not be comparing ourselves to to other people. And Paul said this is not good. It's not healthy for you to do that. You should compare yourself to Jesus. And how he responds to situations. Okay. I did not say don't get a mentor. I did not say that there are people in my life. Especially older men that I look to. Even including older ladies that I look to. That have walked with God. And I, I try to mirror their, their example in certain situations. But ultimately that can't save my soul. And so when, when Paul said, don't compare yourselves among yourselves, he wasn't saying don't have mentorships and don't gain growth and understanding from other people's experiences. He was saying, I want you to know that at the end of the day, you need to compare yourself to Jesus Christ and say, this is where I fall short. And so Ephesians 4 tells us the ministry is God's gift to the church until they grow up. That's literally what the scripture says, until you grow up to be like daddy. And that is Jesus Christ. He's the perfect man. Compare yourself to him. And understand that he is going to walk through these situations with you. But not only do you want him to be with you. Not only do we want to live out the footprints in the sand poem where he carries us. We also want to become like him. We want to learn to respond to situations like him. Do you think that I'm not preaching to myself? I'm still struggling with everything I'm preaching about brother James. Still struggling with those things. And when I stop struggling it means I'm not going to be breathing anymore. But I feel like at every point, I gain a little character. I grow a little bit more. And I'm about to give you a scripture in closing that kind of seals the deal. Because we pray for peace, okay? But we understand that peace in this world, it, it looks different, okay? It does not look like the, the peace of the flower children. First of all, we know that the peace of this world is not the peace of God. Right. But let's just say for a moment, we need to understand how peace is obtained in this world. It's obtained from one of two ways, by offensive means or by defensive means. Okay? Governments of this world obtain peace by offensive means or by defensive means. Offensive means mean you go and conquer somebody. 
and then there's peace in the land. That's how the Roman army, the Roman government, lasted for, oh, probably close to a thousand years. They had something in Jesus' time called the Pax Romana, which means the peace of the Romans. And they had peace because everywhere they went, they used strong military might to conquer everybody and enslave some of them, but the most of them were allowed to live in relative peace. So most of the people in the Roman Empire, this is a historical fact, were glad that the Romans were there. The only ones that could live under the Roman control were the northern part of the Celts, the Pictish peoples, uh, and uh, certain Scandinavian and German tribes. Most of the other peoples had kind of a singular culture throughout Europe and throughout uh, what we call Asia Minor and North Africa, and they actually lived under Roman rule gladly. And every time the Romans were kicked out, other tribes would come in and conquer them. So that's one kind of peace, conquering, okay? There's another kind of peace, which is a defensive peace, which means if you have enough weapons, you can intimidate somebody into leaving you alone. You can do that. If you have enough, now there's a, I told you about the house that's close to where my mom lives. It is, it is a trailer that's probably from the 1960s. It's falling apart, and the guy's got a six-foot-high, six-inch steel gate around it. <laughs> and I look at the place. It is a ramshackle property. I can't even imagine what he is wanting to protect when I look at it <laughs> because it's broken down cars and a broken down trailer, but I have never seen such a fence in my life except around the U.S. Embassy in Kathmandu <coughs> and around the U.S. Recreation Center in Kathmandu. That wall is two feet thick and the gate is two feet thick. This guy has got some serious steel going on on his redneck ranch, okay? <laughs> and I, I'm not, I, I said that for your benefit situation, because I know you call it the redneck ranch. I'm just joking, because I'm 50% I'm redneck anyway. So this guy, I don't know what he is protecting, but I'm telling you right now, I believe it's not the trailer and the broken down trucks. I think he's got some ammunition in there. Yes. I think he's got some Republic of Texas stuff going on saying, this is my own little country and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what I can. He's right on the Red River, he can fish for catfish, and he is just fine. And I am not going to go door knocking in his house. Not gonna, unless the Holy Ghost says so, I should say that. <laughs> Holy Ghost says so, I'm going to go door knock. And I, I wonder if the pastor in that area has been door knocking in his house. I've never seen such a thing in my life. Okay, so that's the defensive piece. I want you to know that the Bible teaches us that we are to use the weapons of our warfare in offensive ways, the word of the Lord, and defensive ways. But I'm telling you that Jesus brings a peace that is, it comes through a third ability, a third power. When he speaks peace, there may be, in fact, no weapons. <laughs> because the Bible says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Oh, yeah. And it has nothing to do with the sharpness of my sword or the amount of ammunition that I have. Praise God. The Bible says that every tongue that rises in judgment against me, God will condemn. Yeah. The Bible tells me that if nature comes against me by the power of the enemy, that if he comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Did you know that nature has the power to cancel out a tsunami? Did you know that? If there's an earthquake in one place and the tsunami starts, all it takes is an earthquake in another place to stop the tsunami. God is able to put up a standard against the devil. I'm telling you that we serve the master of the chaos. I'm telling you that we need to get our minds thinking like Jesus thinks. And understand that technically speaking it's not chaos. And understand that they've got the power in the name of Jesus. The song used to say, though Satan rages, we will not be defeated. Praise the Lord. So the next time you're troubled in your situation, lift up your voice to Jesus and speak over it. And say, oh God. I look to you and I trust in you and I believe in you. And I know that this is not really chaos. You say, Brother well, Hudson, it's easy for you to say it's not chaos. The ocean is quite intimidating and the winds are quite intimidating. I'm telling you that this works because I, I've told you, I'm going to give you some detail right now. I told you that when I was working these last two months, the wind was the worst enemy of what we were trying to do, shrink wrap in those boats. And one day, okay, you go try to hang on to a 35 by 20 foot tarp when the wind is blowing. It will create a kite out of you. 
and you're standing up there six feet in the air on this much piece of a pontoon. One day, me and this other guy, Brother Jason, were on Coon Lake. Yeah, Coon Lake Beach, at, just in Columbus. And the gust of wind came along in the wrong, usually it's coming off the lake, came along in the wrong direction. And it took that, it was like a 25 foot pontoon. So it was a 35 foot piece of plastic by 20 feet. And he was holding on to one end, I was holding the other, and it caught it right up in there. And I felt myself, I felt my heels come off of that boat. I want you to know it can be intimidating at times. But we only had about, out of 400 boats, we only had 10 situations that involved bad wind. You know why? Because I was praying every day, Lord, we need you. I, this is my livelihood here. I'm trying to make a little, get some bills paid. I need you to stop this in the name of Jesus. And even those 10 situations where we had severe winds, we were still able to get the boat wrapped sooner or later. We had to come back a couple of times. But out of all of the probably 60, 55 or 60 days that we were working, God blessed us. He kept yeah. blessing us and he kept Lord. blessing us. I'm talking about the actual wind. Brother Huss, this is where you go crazy and you start talking about things that are just off the wall. The Bible says I'll be a fool for Christ's sake. I'm not kidding that God controls the actual weather. So if He controls the actual weather, He can control your situation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Lord is able to keep us and to keep that which we have committed unto Him against that day. Stand up right now so I'll stop preaching. I'll be going another hour if you don't stand up. Thank you, Jesus. That you are the master of the chaos. Thank you, Jesus, that you're the master of the wind, the wave, and that you are you now. Close the service with just a time of praise, praising the Lord. And if you want to praise Him over your situation, that is in order. We're talking about the difference between order and chaos. We're understanding that in God's systems, there is no chaos. Thank you, Jesus. Let's gather around the phone.